Greetings, Earth and Space Explorers, and happy Earth Month. Welcome to Doc Waller's Earth and Space Report for Friday, April 23, 2021. I'm your host, Bill Waller, an astronomer, science educator, and communicator, coming to you on a clear and calm spring evening in Rockport, Massachusetts. These Earth and Space Reports are intended to engage and inform people like you who are curious about Earth as a planet, who care about our life-sustaining environment, and who wonder about the greater cosmos, including our place in space and moment in time. Video recordings of these reports are archived on the Earth and Space Reports YouTube channel. Today, we are joined by members of the Rockport Research Explorers, Rockport Cultural Council, Cape Ann Climate Coalition, and other curious folk. Thank you for coming. Our special guest for this evening is Ian Kerr. Ian is the Chief Executive Officer of Ocean Alliance an organization recognized as an international leader in whale research and ocean conservation since its founding in 1971 by renowned scientist, Dr. Roger Payne. Ocean Alliance's programs include the longest continuous study of a great whale species, the Patagonia right whale program, as well as many educational initiatives that have engaged students with oceanic wildlife. Under Ian and Roger's leadership, Ocean Alliance has become a leader in developing innovative benign research tools and techniques that involve scientists and conservationists alike. Ian's passion for conservation science has driven him to run more than 60 oceanic expeditions around the globe and to author or co-author more than 80 scientific papers. In 2014, he was cited by the Annenberg Foundation as one of its 25 global visionary leaders. This evening, Ian will be talking on whales and new research technologies, what we can learn from their snot and poo. So Ian, welcome to our little gathering and thank you for enlightening us on this fascinating topic. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, you know, I must say what fun already, Annenberg 25 visionary leaders, and he's talking about snot and poo. So I, I think that goes well. And actually I wanna share something with you, you may not know, but um, Roger Payne, our founder, was a good friend of Carl Sagan. Mm. And um, Carl Sagan was doing the golden record on the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And um, our recordings are on the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft. So actually, technically, I think we're one of the only nonprofits with a, a program in deep space. And, and <laughs> I, will, I will say to you, just FYI, Carl Sagan would call up the Institute in those old days and Often then I would answer the phone and it was very funny because he would say, hello, it's Carl Sagan, to which I'd reply, Carl, I knew who it was at hello. But anyway, <laughs> all right, let's talk about whales. We don't know, we won't be talking about whales in space, but, but a bit of fun that our whale recordings are out there. I think in the heliosphere, is that right? Where the solar winds of other stars is now greater than our own star. I think anyway, they're a long way out. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we go. So again, you mentioned this bill, we were founded in 1971 by Roger Payne, and Roger is actually best known for discovering that whales sing songs. And a lot of people think this discovery that whales sing songs really sort of engaged not only the Save the Whale movement, but potentially even you know the, the larger environmental movement when we became more aware of, 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 of sort of the world around us. Um, we are based in Gloucester, Massachusetts here. Here are our buildings uh, on the waterfront. So if some of you wonder why I'm talking, you know, with, with Bill and Rockport is we, we are on the waterfront and we're actually restoring those buildings that were originally an old, old paint manufactory. And we're, we're, we're trying to turn them into a, a innovation center with the idea where technology, biology, art, science, music will come together and one of our ideas actually is to replace one of the buildings with a floating building. The idea being that this will be the first ever um, climate change future proof building, certainly on the East Coast. I mean, maybe there's one in Europe. But anyway, we're, we're excited and we're moving forward. And the photographs at the bottom here are just giving you an idea. The buildings wouldn't be floating all the time. They'd actually be on what they call spuds. So when the tide went down, the buildings would be sitting there. But I'm just trying to give you an idea of, of the innovation is really pervasive through everything we do from 
the work offshore to the work onshore and to our collaborations, if you like. And one thing we're, we're very interested in, which is a big buzzword right now, is the blue economy. So I'm not going to talk a lot about this. You can just sort of see some of the ideas here. But, you know, from my perspective, at least, as populations grow, you know, and as land mass are, are forever filled, humanity is going to be looking more and more to our oceans for solutions, whether it be recreation, food, materials, or whatever. And what Ocean Alliance is interested in is really just sustainability. Let's do this, you know, let, let's, let's, let's just do this in a sustainable manner that's good for the oceans, good for the whales, good for humans. And with that, you know, I, I just, I really do believe that humanity's future is in our oceans. And I'm not going to read the whole list on the, on I guess my left here from bioinnovation, but I think it's really exciting. And, and you've got to remember, you know, 71% of the planet is water. Um, so we really do have to look to our oceans and, and the new technologies and the new ideas. And I really think New England, particularly Gloucester, Rockport, this, this area is really well positioned with not only our history of innovations, whether it be Tara Watson or, or Hammond or Bell, but just because of the natural harbors and the resources and the people, you know, that we've got. I think we're, I'm very excited that Ocean Alliance is here in Gloucester. And, and again, even the fact that an astronomer would invite a biologist for a talk, you know, thank you. So our motto, if you like, is healthy whales, healthy oceans, healthy humans. You know, from my perspective, I find whales just absolutely fascinating. And there are many contradictions in how whales live their lives. And there's so much we have to learn about them. But even if you don't care about whales, you need to understand whales are important bioindicators for ocean health. And at the end of the day, humanity is totally dependent on healthy oceans for our own survival. I mean, our oceans are the largest mediating force on this planet. We need healthy oceans. And I will say with that, I think as a species, we're not very good at naming things. And I think whoever called it planet Earth should be fired because it's not planet Earth, it's planet ocean. And, and Bill, I even have some problems every now and then when people talk about the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and whatever, you know, when a whale is swimming around, you know, Cape, um, Cape of Good Hope or whatever, it doesn't go, woohoo, I mean, the Atlantic from the Indian Ocean, you know what I mean? It is just one giant ocean. And I will say the one thing that I think you've probably heard that astronauts have really understood, if you've met any of these astronauts, I've been lucky to meet a couple, you know, when they get out into space and they look back, it really is a blue planet, planet ocean. And I even think Carl Sagan in one of the photographs from the Voyager talked about the pale blue dot. There's this giant screen with just one small dot on it. And I think from a biologist perspective, one of the major discoveries, if you like, over the last century has not been what many people would think. It hasn't been E equals M squeeze, MC squared or whatever. It's actually understanding the interconnectedness of life. And actually I could do a whole one hour talk on that. But I think the simplest way to talk about it, if you don't mind being here in Gloucester is we all understand what it, we all have an idea of a food chain. We've all been told what food chains are and we all know what anchor chains are. And we all understand on an anchor chain, if you remove one link from that chain, it doesn't work anymore. And I think one thing we need to understand as a species, all of these species on the screen and many more are the species that are really keeping planet ocean working, are keeping the oceans fertile, are keeping things happening. And um, as we lose these different species, you know, um, it's really gonna have a severe impact on, on these sort of ecosystems and, and, and on humanity. So interconnectedness of species. And a friend of mine likes to talk about, it's almost as if um, on spaceship Earth, the humans are sitting in first class and just consuming everything. 
while all the other species are actually doing all the work while we, while we in many ways take them for granted. Anyway, moving on. You know, whales, I think people are like, why should I care about whales? What, what are important about whales? Well, you know, I actually think that one of the reasons fisheries have collapsed is because we killed millions of whales. And we look about the, this, this whale pump here, and we look about um, you know, biomass carbon and nutrient flux that we have down here. You know, if you imagine um, an animal like a sperm whale, for example, will probably defecate between quarter, around a quarter of a ton a day. So imagine if you have killed a million sperm whales, okay? Well, guess what that means? That means you've got a quarter million tons less every day of fertilizer on our oceans. And if you think about it at its most basic level, sun comes down and shines on the oceans, 71% of the planet. You've got the phytoplankton there. The phytoplankton are just plants. Plants need fertilizer. The whales have what have been fertilizing our oceans. I mean, it's a very simple story for a complicated issue, but I just want to understand that, that I think whales are, 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 whales in many ways are like the ocean's earthworms. You know, they're driving around. And again, we're not going to get too deep into nutrient flux, carbon flux, waste products, but it's something I think maybe some of your listeners could explore, understanding deadfall carbon, biomass carbon. Certainly, if I've got my next slide right, no, I haven't. It'll come up in a minute. From my end, alas, it looks like we're in a growth industry. Um, when I started in this business about 30 years ago, it was really pretty simple. It was commercial whaling. You know, commercial whaling, whalers were killing whales and we had to stop them. And certainly now we've got commercial whaling is still ongoing in some places, but again, the list to the left, pollution, bycatch, ship strikes, habitat loss, noise pollution, climate change, acoustic bleaching. And again, I'd be happy to talk about any of these things. Maybe if somebody wants some questions or maybe if some of your friends from Rockport can, you can bring a group over one afternoon, Bill, in the summer to, to um, our offices. But the, the photographs are sort of in the middle of the screen there with all of the red lines. Those are ship traffic off Boston. So you can see there's a lot of ship traffic. And I think that was just one week of ships traffic out of Boston. So there's a lot going on. So certainly at my end, we have a real challenge at Ocean Alliance. And, you know, Henry David Thoreau said, we do not associate the idea of antiquity with the oceans as we do the land, for they are unchangeable ever, always. So Henry David Thoreau, of course, was America's first environmentalist. And yet he didn't understand. He was saying the oceans are unchangeable. We have learned that is no longer the case. And in many, many ways, the problem is the oceans are downhill from everything. So the detritus from our consumer lifestyle inexorably washes its way down into the ocean, whether that be visible products like plastic or, or other stuff, or invisible products like DDT, PCBs, and even, even microplastics. So Ocean Alliance has a real problem with reference to studying our oceans and engaging people, if you don't mind, I often feel with an invisible problem. You know, it looks great out there. What's the problem? The second issue at our end, or the second big challenge, is what we call ocean exploration and economics. This um, vessel to the left is a Woods Hole vessel. I think it costs around $35,000 a day to run that vessel. So oceanography has sort of long been a prerogative of the privilege, do you know what I mean? Yet you need money to be able to go out and do this research. Ocean Alliance recently sold our research vessel. That research vessel cost us about $400,000 a year, whether we went out on expeditions or not. Just owning that boat cost us about $1,000 a day. So as much as I said Ocean Alliance was a small nonprofit, you know, these are large amounts of money. So. We were struggling with this issue when we're doing research. And, and from my perspective, I've been lucky to work in over 20 countries all over the world. And when I was out in Papua New Guinea, Galapagos, Ecuador, Dominican Republic, 
you would meet incredibly incredible people. They were smart, they were talented, they were energetic. They just didn't have the resources. And that long became a frustration for me. The other major challenge I felt we were dealing with is what I call the endangered species catch 22. And if you've watched almost any sort of wildlife documentary, you'll see scientists chasing down animals and biopsying them. That's an endangered animal. Bill, okay, tomorrow what I want you to do is run down the street and I'm gonna chase you down and biopsy you to find out how healthy you are. You'll probably be less healthy by the time I chase you down the street. So there's a real challenge here. So on the right hand side were people that would say, we need to know everything about these animals that we can learn so we can save them. So we've got to biopsy them, we've got to chase them, we've got to tag them, we've got to learn everything we can about their health. Because a lot of wildlife, if it's sick, it won't show you that it's sick because if it does, it becomes more bioavailable to predators. Me, I get a hangnail, I, I, I scream like a, like a small child. But wildlife, it, it's very hard to, you can't just look at an animal like a whale and say, is it sick? So a lot of what Ocean Alliance does is, is we try to do health assessments of both individuals and populations. So on the right-hand side, these people are saying, okay, we've got to learn all we can about these animals. And on the left-hand side, we've got people saying, don't touch them. Don't do anything that might push these animals over the edge of extinction. Do you know what I mean? So these are the challenges I've been facing throughout my career. Oceanography is expensive. It's hard to engage people with some of the problems that we're looking at because you can't see them. You know, if a forest is, is falling apart, you can see it. And this whole issue, this catch 22 of, of you know, endangered species. So as I said, how did Ocean Lions collect biological examples from a whale? Well, there you can see on the left-hand screen, there is my biopsy and we would get within about 50 feet of an animal and then we would shoot a dart into it, okay? And we've got this little tissue sample and this tissue sample would be a time capsule into the health of the animal. The tissue samples were about the size of a pencil eraser or my little finger. So they were very small. And I was down in the Gulf of Mexico working with sperm whales after the Deepwater Horizon disaster, whereas, you know, millions of gallons of oil and perhaps even worse, millions of gallons of, of um, a dispersant mm. were pumped into the Gulf of Mexico. So we wanted to say, what's going on with sperm whales? The problem we had, you see our research vessel Odyssey there, we were about 100 miles offshore. I felt I was playing the world's most expensive game of whack-a-mole, because I would race over here, and then the whale would dive. And I'd be, oh, over there. And then I'd race over there, and the whale would dive. Meanwhile, I'm ripping up $100 a bill for this $100 bills because you've got the research vessel, you've got all these people. And, you know, I have to go back to our sponsors and say, our work is valuable. You gave us this money. Look at what I learned. So one night at the end of the day, the whale dove. And you know what? I got to be honest. It was not a good day. We hadn't got very many samples. We'd been racing all over the place. And I was upset and I was worried. One, I was worried because we weren't getting the data we needed for our health assessment. And two, we were spending a lot of money. And as I was sitting on the boat, it was the end of the day, the sun was going down. I got enveloped in this cloud of whale snot. And some of you may be lucky enough to go out in a whale watch here out of Gloucester or been out in other whale watches. And you will know that snot is not a pleasant product. It is not a lovely perfume. It is fishy, it is smelly, it makes you gag. And luckily, as a biologist, you know, while I was, to me, it was like the ultimate insult. Not only did I not get a sample from this whale, but it like blew snot all over me. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So my clothes were then stinky and you're on a boat and, you know, um, I was pretty upset. But, but like it is a biologist, I went, you know what? Typically smelly means productive. And I was like, I wonder what is in these blows. And I'll make a long story short. And you'll see here, well, guess what? We found RNA, DNA, hormones, pollutants, microbiomes. And 
whales are actually what we call explosive breathers. You know, you and I breathe out quite slowly. Now, if I give you an example, when we sneeze, dare I be blunt, particulate gets blown into our handkerchiefs. Whales are blowing out at speeds of over 100 miles an hour. So they're actually sloughing off little bits of skin. And, you know, the, our lungs are the, the closest sort of barrier to the outside world to the, the, the venous system of that animal. So you've got, anyway, what it basically means is we're getting priceless biological data is just being thrown up into the air. And it's like, wow, so that means that we could like fly into the whale snot. And what's exciting here, part of the problem I was having on the boat with my game of whack-a-mole is, you know, I'd see the whale half a mile away surface, but by the time I got over there, it was getting ready to dive. You know what I mean? And then by the time I got there to dove, and I'm like, could we just get over there quicker? But you don't want to do it with a fast boat. If you've ever been diving and you hear an outboard motor, it's like, ee! you know, this is hardly a benign research te technique racing over in a small boat. And we've seen whales respond negatively to small boats. So I'm like, wait a minute, can we fly a drone into the exhalation of a whale? And the answer is yes. And here it is, as a friend of mine liked to say, the most aptly named drone in the world, Snotbot. Now, we tried all sorts of snot collection devices, and there are some amazing super sponges there and super collectors, but guess what? When these super sponges collected all the snot, then you had to get it out of the super sponges. And was, was there something in the super sponge that might actually be affecting the data? You know, could there be Felix or, or whatever? So at the end of the day, and you know, these are sometimes the best solutions. We just stick some Petri dishes on there. The drone flies through the whale snot. The dishes are covered. We've got a little camera at the bottom there. You see our FPV camera. When the camera is covered in snot, I know the dishes are covered in snot. And I come home and bingo, there it is. We've got our sample. And I'll give you a little video here. If you see snot bot on the right here, and I have to say, this is a blue whale. If you can't, which is the largest animal to ever existed on the planet, its tongue would weigh about seven tons, okay? So its lungs are bigger than a VW. So if you can't collect snot from a blue whale, you can't get it from any whale. But I thought you might like to just see the video. So here is Snotbot collecting a snot from a blue whale. Now that whale has had no idea we've just done a biological assessment. And if you don't mind, Bill, I'm gonna play that again. Did the video come out okay? Just fine. All right, I'll just play it one more time then just to see it. And it's fun that the whale's blowing out. So the drone's about 15 feet above the whale. And even so that exhalation is so strong, okay? It, it, it blows the drone. Now the next video, we had a 360 degree camera on the on the um, drone. And by the way, we shot that video with another drone because we want to make sure that the whale doesn't respond to the first drone. So, you know, we're, we're collecting data on the data collection, you know? So here's one now with a 360 camera that I love. And, and I wish all whale exhalations were this good. This is a pretty successful one. So look at that. Can you see all the snot on the dish? And by the way, we fly backwards to the boat just so that we don't get the snot off. And you know what? I'm going to play that one one more time here just so you see it. You see the dishes? Here's a whale coming up. It does a blow. Look at that. Look at those dishes. And there are six dishes there covered with snot. One of the groups that we're actually partnering with is um, Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute, who are looking at at the microbiomes. And what I love about our partners, when you talk to the people that are doing the DNA analysis, they're like, well, the DNA is the most important because we can learn about the individual, male, female, sex, relatives, population dynamics. Then you talk to the microbiome people. Oh, the microbiomes are most important because it tells you the health of the animal, how it's interacting with the oceans and the food chain. And then you talk to the hormone people. 
Ah, the hormones are most most important, and so on and so on. So it's it's great that all of our partners love their data sets. Now, just FYI, here is the type of boat that we use, and we hand launch and and hand recover the drone here. So rather than a 93 foot research vessel, here you've got like four people in a boat, and there you see the petri dishes. And she's not wearing a mask there because of COVID. She's wearing a mask so that she doesn't exhale onto the Petri dish. And I'll actually do that one again. But now, rather than a, a giant boat and lots of money, we can literally go out on a little boat and then fly like up to a mile away over to where the whales are. So we'll play that one one more time. Here we go. This is me flying and this is Chris catching. But um, there you go. It's, you know, it's not too bad. This is um, in Baja. There's Alicia, I think, is actually watching this show. And a um, bit of fun. So this is all taken from the 360-degree camera. And you can see the snot on the dish and, and just gets folded up and, and taken away. So here are some successful snotty dishes. That's all we need. I mean, you know, like, you know, the, the police labs nowadays can just, um, you know, you can just drink a glass of water and they can get enough DNA off there. So... It's really exciting what we're learning. And what is just as exciting, we're now putting um, cameras with a fixed focal lens underneath the drone, and we're doing other work. So this shot in the middle, it's photogrammetry, okay? We're measuring the whales, not, <clears throat> not just how long they are, but basically how fat they are. And that is morphometrics, and it's really pretty simple. A fat whale is a healthy whale, and a skinny whale is unhealthy. So if we find an unhealthy animal, we can spend more time with it. But you see on the left, we've got photogrammetry, photo ID, tracking, behavior, population distribution, bioacoustics, and actually we're doing infrared studies now, looking at scars, and actually for the first time, we're trying to see if we can take the temperature of a whale with a thermal camera. Because how humans do it with a, with a um, thermometer, um, you know, Bill, if you wanna come down and try to stick a thermometer in a whale or a phrase, you're, 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 my, you're welcome. Anyway, moving on. All right, I like to do a little bit of a, just sort of a, a history of Snotbot, just tell the stories behind it, if you like. And to be clear, while my job was a biologist, you know, my, my hobby, and many people are like this, I wanted a hobby that was sort of different. So I like to fly things, although between all of us here, I would crash them and rebuild them more often than I would fly them. But that is why when I was sitting on the bow of the Odyssey, I'm like, wait a minute, we could fly something into the snot. And this was at a time just as drones were coming about. So luckily, the if I'd had this idea in 2000, you know, it wouldn't have worked. But anyway, so you see here, we're starting top left and we're going around. So we, we, we built all sorts of drones. The, the white drone in the middle there, we thought that we would need a waterproof drone, but it turns out a waterproof drone is heavier, the batteries get hot, everything's in the waterproof container, it didn't work. And of course, by the way, the permitting authorities were not gonna just let us go out, hey, we've got a good idea, can we try it over endangered species? So this device to the right is what we call snot shot, okay? And it's really just a compressed air gun, and we would fly the drone over snot shot and those orange things below are actually 3D printed blowholes. So we had different blowholes from different whales, and then we'd fly the drone over snot shot to prove that we could collect data. So we did that ashore, but ultimately we had to say, well, could we do it offshore? So that very bottom photograph, guess what? Can anyone think of the name? It is the snot yacht. So we've got the snot yacht and we've got snot shot. I know, whatever, whatever works, you know, but anyway, so we had all sorts of pressure plate sensors and wind speed and, and actually um, hydrophones underneath. And what's actually very interesting is we proved that the whales cannot hear the, the high frequency sound of the drone. We all probably find those drones incredibly annoying. I don't like the sounds, but high frequency sounds are not going through the water barrier. So if you think of a whale, it's used to getting air across its back it's used to having seagulls swimming around because when the whales feed, birds are diving in the water and it's not hearing the, the sound of the drones. Eventually, the shot in the middle here with the reddest sticker on it 
we've got this drone called an Inspire 2, which is a sort of a quite a linear design drone that was very well designed for placing Petri dishes and, and collecting um, the whale snot. The one thing that I didn't realize, which I guess is obvious now, by the way, so I guess here is a, a paper on snot boat versus ocean noise. I thought when you had a brilliant idea, whale biologists and the permitting authorities would be, please, you've got a great idea. Come on out and sort of test it out on the whales. And unfortunately, a lot of our ideas, we have to go out and test outside of America, validate it outside of the country, come back, report to the permitting authorities, and then they give us a permit. It's a bit of a shame. Certainly, we've got great collaborators all over the world, but I would much rather be doing this work, you know, here at home. Another big challenge that I, is sort of counterintuitive, you know, the venture capital market in this region is really good. But I think the venture philanthropy isn't as good. You know, I've had, I've had, in the beginning, I really couldn't find anybody to fund this project, which, by the way, has been one of the most successful projects we've ever had. We're now partnering with over 30 organizations around the world last year using drones as research tools. So that's pretty exciting. Our protocols are being used worldwide. The, the lucky thing for me is a friend of mine is Sir Patrick Stewart, who obviously you spend a lot of time out in deep space, Bill, so you should <laughs> like him. So I, called up, yeah. so I called up Patrick and said, hey, Patrick, could we harass you to, to do a little video to raise money um, for our campaign? And he said, absolutely. So here I am harassing Sir Patrick Stewart at home. Just collecting data. What the heck is that? What is going on? I'm just measuring your stress levels. All right, Ian, enough of this harassment. I need to know what is going on. I'm collecting your snot. Why do you need my tissue with my snot on it? Come outside and I'll explain it to you. What's going on here? We're really looking for ways to collect biological data without harassing the animals. And here comes our drones, we affectionately call Snotbot. Ocean Alliance has been at the forefront of marine mammal research for over 40 years. So there we go. Actually, you see us launching the Snot yacht there. But um, yeah, so you know what was very cool? So we did a Kickstarter campaign with Sir Patrick and actually raised $200,000. Um, the only disappointing component about that, that I would say if anyone learn, what, who's interested in this type of project is Kickstarter, you often give people something. Do you know what I mean? You know, it's like right. you, you get a t-shirt or something. So we actually spent like $60,000 in products. It was great though. It was great to have Sir Patrick Stewart. We had a lot of fun. We raised some money and we got, um, we got Snotbot off the ground. Since that time, um, you know, One Strange Rock is currently on um, Netflix right now. We're in episode six with Will Smith. We've been on uh, Blue Planet Live, BBC. I think just on this page, we have over a, a million hits. So what I'm excited about is, you know, the drones, the name has engaged people's imagination you know we and it, we've got people thinking about oceans we've got think people thinking about whales and it's really been an exciting time and actually we have an expedition to the azores in, in june but it's i i learned you know i'm i'm, I'm a biologist not a marketing person but certainly your name is is sort of critically important i do feel though that the drone industries most of the drone industries i encounter don't seem to understand the potential of, of sort of drones for nonprofit. Your typical drone businesses are pipelines, you know, agriculture, you know, power stations or, or mapping for chemicals. And again, I, I really see environmental monitoring as a growth industry. You know, if and when they put windmills offshore, they're going to want people monitoring to see how it affects the whales, the fish, whatever. You know, aquaculture projects. 
I think it's a very exciting time for these affordable tools that can engage people. Again, every country we've been to, and we've been to um, five different countries, we've left them with a drone. We've left them mm -hmm. with protocols. And it's really exciting. We were in Gabon, West Africa, and it turned out we left them with a drone that they then used to find illegal gold mines. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's very exciting what these new tools are doing. And that's part to the whole story of the paint factory and the innovation center that we're developing on the Gloucester waterfront. Um, the one thing I like to think we've tried to do is, is think outside the box. You know, and there's a guy called Peter uh, Diomedes, I think, who talks about moonshot thinking. You know, most tools, and I don't know if this is the same, I imagine it's the same in astronomy, most tools just make incremental changes. And what's exciting about Snotbot is we've done a giant leap forward here. It's almost like in places in Africa, they're not bothering to run phone lines anymore because they're just going straight to cell phones. Right. So a lot of the infrastructure, the big boats, they don't have to do it because um, we've got this, this drone, this orange drone here is what we call Earbot. And a lot of times when people are recording whale vocalizations, they record from the boat, which can make noise, mm -hmm. or they have a hydrophone on the bottom of the ocean and the whales can swim off. So this little drone of ours, we can fly it over to where the whales are, land it in the water, it records the vocalizations, and now we're trying to create a, a swarm and each drone will talk to each other and maybe we can understand which whale is talking to each other. And again, this isn't costing millions of dollars. These are pretty cheap programs, but they're important programs. Again, we've got issues of ocean plastics and, and so on. So it's an exciting time. And I, I know you can tell that I'm not very enthusiastic about all of this. <laughs> but for me, at least, what I love <coughs> is on one side, I've got people developing ever better drones. And on the other side, I've got people developing ever better sensors. And at one point, we thought that Ocean Alliance would build our drones that we would like sell to people. But we've really tried now to use off the shelf drones so other people can just order a drone. And in many ways, I'm not belittling what we do, but in many ways, we just get a drone, a 3D printer, a sensor, make a bracket, stick it all together, and we, we tell you how brilliant we all are. So, but I think, it's, I think the future is exciting as drones are getting smaller, they're cheaper, they're flying for longer times, and we're getting better sensors. And I think you're gonna hear more and more about them with these types of tools doing this sort of persistent, consistent data collection we need, whether it be on wildlife biology, whether it be on fisheries, whether it be on illegal activities, you know, it, it's, it's an exciting time. Again, I'm also excited that in many ways, Bill, you know, for me, one of my biggest challenges was coming to terms with my own hypocrisy. I'm an environmentalist, but guess what? You know, I, I'm looking around on my desk. I've got to have something plastic somewhere. Actually, maybe my light is plastic, but anyway, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know what I mean? I think we should all be doing the best we can to go through the world with minimum impact, but we are gonna have impact. That's just a fact of life. Mm -hmm. What I'm excited is, can we get everybody that's part of the problem to then be part of the solution? And we're not there yet, and we've heard lots of stories about citizen science, but I think as these drone tools are democratizing science, do you know what I mean? There really will become an opportunity where maybe everybody as part of their consumer lifestyle can have some sort of environmental offset they do. I don't know whether it's collecting data, supporting data. I don't know, it's coming, but, but it, it's exciting. It really is. Um, all right, I'm winding down now and we don't even have to bother to look at this, but I've sort of lived my life in a world of data deficit. We can never get quite enough data. You know, you collect all this data, then you come home and you're like, oh, I wish we'd collected that or I wish we'd saved that. And it's always a challenge. What, what data do you collect? And now these drones, they're collecting so much data. We're, we're basically going from data deficit to data overload, okay? But guess what? A couple of years, our tsunamis of data, that's what I like to call it. Anyway, but even that has been working out 
couple of years ago, we did a project with Intel where they actually took a supercomputer out and we actually use that supercomputer to process data as we're in the field so we could analyze part of the data when we're in the field and have our scientific programs evolve in the field rather than the old model is you have the hypothesis, you go out in the field, you take it back to the lab and maybe a year later you have the program evolve. The capacity to have your program evolve based in data that you're collecting sort of in real time is an exciting future and we're there at certain different levels but to me it's all about doing this work affordably um again on the bad news front i'm sorry to say many species of whales are still endangered you know and i think a lot of people are less worried about whales because a bunch of them have come off the endangered list and if the endangered list is here and the population level is there and it used to be up here somewhere, you know, that doesn't help. You know, I go back to where we started, healthy whales, healthy oceans, healthy humans, you know. On the flip side of that, let's see if I can rem remember my next slide. Yay. <laughs> there was a very interesting report done recently by the International Monetary Fund on what is a whale worth. And top left here, I started my talk talking about how whales are like ocean earthworms and they're fertilizing the sea for the primary producers like phytoplankton. The whale watching industry, Gloucester knows, do you know what I mean? How whales sequester carbon. And again, phytoplankton production. It is thought that the, the world's whale populations right now are worth in the order of trillions of dollars. So at the end of the day, you can be selfish and say, I don't care about whales, but I understand we need healthy whales because we need healthy humans for our own survival, for our own well-being, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm ending the, the talk now, and I always like to laugh at this. I was talking with my daughter one day, and I said, you know, there's only one thing as individuals that we actually have control over, to which she replied, the TV remote? Yeah. And that may have been the case in that situation, but we often forget the one thing we as individuals control is our own mind. You cannot blame somebody else for decisions you make. Am I going to get something that's biodegradable? Am I going to get something that I can recycle? We make hundreds of these decisions every day. And I think with new technologies, with conversations like this, I want people to see the opportunities that are here. I want people to change their minds as to the value of healthy oceans. And certainly in this sort of tech savvy hub of Boston, Gloucester, the Northeast, perhaps create tools that will change the world. And I, I remain excited, Bill. And when people say to me, what can you do? I think the worst thing that you can do is do nothing. Again, there's a gentleman in England called Edmund Burke who said, nobody did worse than he who did nothing for fear they could only do a little. Our environment is being trashed by the sort of endless wave of tiny products, whether it be plastics, chemicals, into the ocean. You know, we can stop that as individuals and we can change the world. Thank you. That was awesome, Ian. Um, and uh, I'm sure that we have uh, questions. Uh, I see uh, Bill Wall has a, a question already. I just want to make sure that in the chat, uh, there was one. Uh, Bill asked I think a question. That was a question, Bill. No, yeah, kidding. Bill, may, uh, Bill, could you just ask the question that you did in the chat? Yeah, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna do that. I just wanted to say I really enjoyed your talk. It was really interesting. Um, it was great listening to you drone on about drones. Sorry, I had to say that. Well said, well said. Good, I like it. I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my, my question is, uh, you can use the the snot to um, determine the health of the whales. So, do whales have colds? Well, oh man, that's a cat. Okay, Bill, is there any way we can bump onto the next question? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, you know. We have, not, we have not found any data to suggest that. I can tell you, Bill, what's interesting 
we're working on a project now to better understand whether water is going into the lungs and inhalations. Whales do get sick, but generally speaking, I think I would say to you, whales don't, don't get colds. Somebody has hypothesized as a mammal, whales could get COVID, but I mean, I would actually go back to you, Bill, and say, you know what? This is what makes my job so interesting. Some of the fundamental questions we don't have answers for, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And I think that's a great question. And uh, I'm hoping at least one person will answer, ask a question tonight that I can actually answer. It's highly unlikely, but we'll give it a go. But thank you, good question. Thanks. Well, just hanging on that question, uh, what about the bacteria that you collect? You probably culture it. You know, that's what Petri dishes do. That's right. Well, that's, what, that's the work that GNGI are doing. Mm -hmm. And again, I think they're specifically looking sort of at the different biological microbiomes, but you, you should get a GMGI person on here to sort of give a talk and explain a little bit more about sort of how microbiomes work. As you know, actually I had a, um, I had a kombucha for dinner. You know, there are more microbiome cells probably on in our bodies and actually human cells. And almost as I started the talk, talking about the independence of things, you know, the microbiomes are what enabled us to function. They help digest our food and so on and so on. Okay. Yeah. So that uh, the microbiome of uh, the whales would be of great interest. Uh, so um, we're getting some questions about uh, whether acidification of the oceans uh, has an impact on, on the whales. Well, I, you know what? I think that will have a huge impact because a lot of these, um, and I'm going to forget the word here, maybe somebody can help me, but a lot of pr plankton and krill, you know, that the, I'm trying to remember the shells, what, what, um, Chit I can't remember. They, thank, they, oh God, that, they, yeah, exactly. That, that, is it called chitin? Or oh, anyway. Chitin, yeah, maybe that's it. But they need, they cannot create chitin if, if the water is too acidic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's fascinating. We need to be very careful because we can go on to tangents, but I was in the Mediterranean for a while and there's an, an, an old volcanic island that has been bubbling uh, in the Med now for like, it's been recorded for over a hundred years. And it is still like a wasteland around that island mm -hmm. because the water is so acidic. So the issue we have is almost like we talk about climate change. You know, the climate has changed many times over many millions of years. We are affecting the rate of change and mm -hmm. most species cannot respond quickly enough. Do you know what I mean? This mm -hmm. is an issue with, with coral reefs and bleaching. They can't, you know, they will evolve and things are changing, but it's the rate of change that humanity is messing up. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Christine Downing asked a question about uh, whether or not whales are affected by the, f the drugs and hormones that are flushed out, flushed into I mean, the ocean. I mean, these, these, are, these are great questions. No simple question, but that's okay. I, you know what? I, I think that's, I think that's a, a really good question that we don't have the answer for. We've talked about that. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm sure you're all aware of this. You know, lots of people I take all sorts of drugs. They go to the bathroom and the drugs just head their way down into the ocean. And I think it's something humanity needs to get a, a better control of. It's, it's sort of interesting. And I'm going to get myself in trouble here. I'm hoping with the current state of the amount that makes it, makes it down to the ocean that the solution will be dilution. Do you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. I've done a lot of work with persistent organic pollutants and a lot of these compounds like PCDs, um, um, PAHs, you know, fire retardants, dioxins, they're as soluble in water as gold, but they're very soluble in fat. So what happens is we wash this stuff into the ocean, plants have fat, animals have fat, and as you work up the, the ocean food chain, the levels of concentration get higher and higher until, the, until they reach a point that they are extremely hazardous to whales' health. And I, I actually believe, um, certainly in the case of toothed whales, I actually believe that many of these whales 
probably lose their first child because they dump their lifetime accumulations of toxic load into that first child. And I'm just throwing it out then, just giving you my opinion. I think the drug one is a very good question. And I think we should try to work to the precautionary principle, which some water treatment plants are now doing to try to collect the, 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 these, these pharmaceuticals. But again, great question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Bill Wall again. Yeah, you mentioned acoustic bleaching. I'm guessing that that's uh, the noise uh, from shipping is, is, uh, is ruining their uh, acoustic environment and must stress the whales. Do you see any signs of that in their snot? Well, in their snot, we don't. But as a group, I mean, as of yet, but I mean, you know, Bill, what's interesting is um, the, how can I say this? The jewel and the hormone crown are stress hormones, okay? Mm -hmm. And the only problem is with most of the other hormones we get, you can say it's male, it's female, it's pregnant, it's lactating or whatever, because just the presence of that hormone tells us a story. With stress hormones like cortisol, it's the concentration that tells you the story. And we're still working on how much of the concentration, you know, how much is in the blow, how much of the blow did we collect and so on. So what we're trying to use now are what we call biomarkers. So we're actually looking at, let's say, the level of urea. And since we know the levels of urea from blood work, then we can compare the level of urea we find in the blow with the levels of hormones in the blow and hopefully quantify if that's stressed or not. But I want to go back a step and talk about acoustic bleaching because acoustic bleaching is one of these ones that is just so tough and it's such a good case study. And let me see if I can explain it well enough. You know, we as a species sort of love the smoking gun. Do you know what I mean? Bill did it. And, you know, the detective's story and we turn over and there's Bill and he's holding the gun and smoke is coming out of it. He fired the gun. It's his fault and the person is dead. Whales live in a world of sound, okay? And I actually think, and again, slightly segue, I think their whole body is their ear. And I think whales are doing things with sound that we can't even imagine. And I don't know how we'll ever be able to interpret, but you know, they, they live in a world of sound. Actually, Roger, our president, proved that blue whales could hear each other across oceans and I actually got access to the military tracking array once and we tracked a blue whale vocalization that went literally thousands of miles. But, but here's the thing that I'm sure you've had. Imagine, um, imagine, let's say three or four of us have to have a conversation every day to decide where we're gonna get the food. And if we don't have that conversation, we're not gonna be able to get the food, okay? Imagine we agree to do that in one of the discotheques or what I'm saying, so aging in a, in, a, in a rave in downtown Boston. Do you know what I mean? It'd be like, we'd be shouting at each other. So my ability to communicate would not be affected. Your ability to hear wouldn't be, you know what I mean? There wouldn't be a profound effect, but the reality is you wouldn't be able to hear me. You wouldn't be able to socialize. And if your whole life, socialization, mating, finding each other, finding food, you know what I mean? Just general sort of whale activities is all dependent on sound. And by the way, they showed with the right whales, something like 30% of the time right now, the right whales off Boston can't hear themselves because of the boats going in and out. Mm -hmm. So this is what they call acoustic bleaching because Again, it's hard to see cause and effect, but it is of great concern. And actually, I will tell you what's rather fun. We're actually talking with a company in Sweden right now, and the company is developing a boat called Ocean Bird. And this is a container ship that carries 5,000 cars. And their whole vision was just to save money for the container ship company. And we've actually spoken to them and said, hey, guess what? You, you're gonna be giving whales an opportunity back to hear each other, to communicate, to socialize. And they're actually talking about letting us put other sensors on the ocean bird as it sails around the ocean quietly. So again, I think 
I'm going, I'm jumping forward and back, but I ask your listeners, particularly any young kids, you know, or teenagers out there, we see problems as opportunities. You can see a problem and be full of despair, or you can see problem and see an opportunity. I agree, there may be too many opportunities for a group like Ocean Lines to tackle right now, but we're, we're taking on the ones we can, so thank you. Uh, well, I have a question with regard to uh, the citizen science. Um, and you did mention how uh, you're using um, AI uh, kind of in a live situation, <clears throat> right on board uh, the boats uh, as, as you're taking your data and then uh, adjusting to what you receive uh, and, and analyzing the data there. But uh, I'm sure you, you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of other data that still begs uh, analyzing. And uh, there are these citizen science platforms such as the Zooniverse, where um, uh, you could work with the, the, the people there to create uh, basically a, a portal for uh, citizen scientists of all stripes <clears throat> to, to go and classify various forms of data. Uh, have you given any thought to this sort of, uh, it would be online citizen I mean science? I'd love to do it. I mean, just so your, your team know, we're actually a pretty small team at Ocean Alliance, you know, um, based on the perception there's two ways to raise money and one way is not to spend it, you know. So we actually have a small team, but it is interesting. We actually got a couple of uh, grants over the last two years. We have one of the largest civilian bioacoustic libraries and um, a group in England called the Color Foundation. And the group is called... Um, CLIR, C-L-I-R, um, it, it's the, um, I'm for, forgetting it now, but it's the, um, it's a library program for recordings at risk. And we've got grants from these two groups to digitize thousands of hours of, of vocalizations we have going back to the 1950s. So we are dragging ourselves, kicking and screaming into this new universe. And, but I'm excited about what you're talking about. Maybe, Bill, you're, you're going to have to come and volunteer and run that program for us. <laughs> it, it sounds like it's a very data intensive problem. Uh, I might not be the best for it, but uh, I'm glad to know that uh, you're working in those areas. Yeah, no, it's exciting. I mean, you know, yeah, the data challenge is an interesting one because when you're out in the field, you want to collect everything and you can almost become non functional because you're, you're trying to collect everything and you can't. But anyway. Mm -hmm. I have, I think what's gonna be the, the final question uh, from Christine Downing. Uh, some time ago, I read about military experiments sending sound from one continent to another. I wondered if it would deafen whales. Ordinary noise pollution is probably worse, but can you comment on this? Is there such a thing as a muffler for boat engine noise? Yeah, so um, again, um, I haven't had a I haven't had an easy question tonight. I think, to, to be blunt, I was actually involved in a BBC documentary about ten years ago called um, "Deaf Whale, Dead Whale," um, and Christine is quite right that um, um, they've had some giant. I mean, these these speakers are, again bigger than a VW, and they'd have like ten of them. And they'd send off this sound that would like a sonify the ocean, trying to make sure there's no submarines or, or whatever. And certainly there is evidence with um, some species of, of whale that if you fire these sonars off, you will kill the whales. You will deafen them. Mm -hmm. um, there's even a theory, I, I'm, I, and again, this could get too complicated too quickly, but I actually think a number of species of whales acclimatized to actually almost living at depth. So in a 24 hour period, they'll actually spend like sperm whales 20 hours when they're of that 20 hours, 18 will be at depth and only two will be at the surface. Do you know what I mean? So they've actually acclimatized to being down at depth, almost like diving. And then they'll come up to the surface slowly over a period of time and decompress. If those animals like beaked whales were forced to the surface too quickly because of traumatic shock, oh. then they would actually die of the bends. So 
there has been work done on this and there have been other groups that have been involved in fighting with the Navy. I think what's going on there right now, and we've been involved with this down in the Gulf of Mexico is basically saying, you know, do not use these military sonars in these locations at this time of year. Right. So if they're breeding or if it's a critical feeding thing. And the other one I hate to tell you is seismic exploration. Right. You know, these air guns that they shoot off, the sound is going through the ocean and thousands of feet underground. And, you know, if there's a whale, remember, remember I said earlier, if, you know, if your whole body is an ear, it would be hard for you not to be traumatized by these sounds. As to Christine's question on, on are there mufflers for boats, just to be clear here, it's not the engine noise that is typically the problem. Mm -hmm. It's the cavitation from the propellers. Right. And I actually, our research vessel was a sailboat and we dragged what was called an acoustic array around the world for years. And I'd sometimes be on watch and these, we'd have the speakers on the bridge and I, I would hear a, a, a big ship 30 miles away, 30 miles away, I, I would hear chung, 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 which is that boat's propellers, you know? So it's a real problem. But um, anyway, you know, yeah, we have to choose our slice of the pie. Right. And as you said, um, uh, you can focus on the problem uh, or uh, orient yourself towards the solution. And uh, that's a good example because it's a, it, it could lend itself to a technological solution. Exactly. As and I think, I mean, I'll tell you this, Bill, you know, Ocean Alliance is a conservation science group. We go out and collect data so we can affect change. We've also discussed with a number of shipping companies the fact that a noisy propeller is actually an inefficient propeller. Mm -hmm. And I've seen online now from other conservation groups that have been pushing this, not us, that they're saying, hey, a quieter propeller means you will save money with every revolution. So there are, you know, there are many environmental problems where rather than saying, hey, you, you're killing the whales, you say, hey, you, you're losing money and killing whales. And then they're like, okay, that's something I can understand. Yeah. Well, you presented one whale of a tail, Ian, and I want to Thank you so very much uh, to uh, be with us here today. Um, the recording will be uh, archived uh, soon uh, on Doc Waller's Earth and Space Reports. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing more from you as time goes on. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. And, and thank you for your listeners who came out on a lovely sunny Friday night. That's right. OK. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, oh.